Hi, I'm Jiayin Tang, scientific editor at Cell, and I'm here for the 80s Cosmic Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. It's a great pleasure for me today to be joined by Dr. Richard Morimoto from Northwestern University in Chicago for a hopefully fun scientific discussion. I look forward. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so Richard, I was, I mean, you're really the pioneer that discovered the um, Hitchcock protein and really sort of set us the stage of really understand the stress response and also like how the whole organism sort of like respond to that. So I was curious how, what, what, what's the click that makes you get interested in this direction to begin with? Well, it's actually a very fascinating moment. Uh -huh. When I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, I heard Matt Messelson, who uh -huh. was of course one of the discoverers of the heat shock response. Sue Lindquist got her PhD with Matt. Right. And Matt came and gave an honorary doctorate talk at the University of Chicago. And at that point, he had just uh, seen these bands on a gel, the chromosome puffs when you heat shock Drosophila. And I sat there in the audience. This is before any genes had been cloned. Mm -hmm. And I sat there and saying, what does a molecular thermometer look like? Why, and why should a fruit fly have a thermometer? Yeah. And of course, I, what's fun for me is here I am continuing to ask that question, mm -hmm. but now going back into the organism, trying to understand not how cells alone detect, but how does the organism integrate these stress signals? Right. Because that's going to be even more relevant for us as humans. Yeah, exactly. So the way you see the field moving, like back then when you first cloned the gene and really discovered protein, characterized protein, to today that people start to think about in both the physiological setting and also pathological setting, right. how do you see the field has been moving and what's, what's, what's been changing in terms of the big questions? Inter interesting. Because heat shock genes were among the very first genes ever cloned yep. in molecular biology, a lot of people started using them to look at diabetes, at heart disease, at mm -hmm. cancer, and neurodegeneration and aging. Yep. We didn't know what the heat shock genes were at that time because even the concept of molecular chaperones didn't exist. Yep. All the effort in the beginning was to understand transcriptional regulation. What is the heat shock response? Mm -hmm. How do you activate genes? What are heat shock factors? Then as that field was growing, then the concept of molecular chaperones exploded. The idea that proteins need chaperones to fold, and with that then came the aha moment, uh -huh. that there are all these diseases of degeneration associated with aging. Right. Could chaperones be an essential component in age-associated degenerative disease. So from the beginning, we had observations that suggested that maybe heat shock genes and heat shock response was tied into disease, but we didn't have enough information to understand why and how, because mm -hmm. the, the, the concept of chaperones and folding hadn't existed when the heat shock genes were cloned. But we were at some level very prepared, and it's actually uh, very uh, appropriate to have this discussion at mm -hmm. Cold Spring Harbor mm -hmm. because the very first meeting on the heat shock response was held in Cold Spring Harbor, if I remember in something like 1980 okay. was the first Cold Spring Harbor meeting and we had a Banbury meeting. Bill Welch and I organized a Banbury conference here mm -hmm. and it was actually the first meeting where we invited people working on different diseases that we thought were stress related. I see. But we didn't understand how they were related. So, for example, cardiac disease right. or uh, hypo hypoxia mm -hmm. uh, or cancer. But people were starting to get very funny observations that heat shock genes were turned on or they were turned off. Mm -hmm. And only now, only now, does it all start to make sense because we have enough biology. Right. And as you point out, it's really exciting now because I think a realization that chaperones and quality control protein mm -hmm. homeostasis is going to be a critical marker of health. Right. So it's interesting when you talk about as a marker, I think especially in many kind of disease settings that one of the things people is trying to do of course is find the diagnostic and prognostic marker and the other thing people always have this discussion is also the cause and consequence. I think there, I mean sometimes there are certain people refer to as the chicken and egg question whatever but I, I was curious what you think in terms of the proteostasis and those, those like neurodegenerative and also aging related disease. Do you see the cause and consequence clear in this context? So I do, uh -huh. uh, but I also see it in the context of understanding the molecular and cellular changes. So for example, 
if in aging of metazoans, mm -hmm. and I think this is even true in yeast, yep. where you see a decline in quality control systems, you see a reduction yep. in chaperones and stress responses, you see an accumulation of misfolded and aggregated proteins. So if we then jump from that and say, that's probably not good for mm -hmm. the health of the cell, and that probably contributes then to the risk for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and hundreds of other diseases. Right. The question then becomes, how much can you change the system and right. for how long? So I posit that if we understand the age-related decline, yep. then it tells us how much we need to increase the system by. Mm -hmm. And it may be that you just need to increase folding or the proteasome or autophagy by 15%. I see. You know, whereas often we wait till something collapses entirely and then we want to bring the whole boat back up. Mm -hmm. But a boat that's sunk completely, it may be very hard. Right. But if you know where the leaks are coming and you, re and you reset it, it may be that the boat will stay floating for a longer period. Yeah. Now to your point earlier also in the question about a biomarker, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that if we identify out of the proteostasis network, the chaperones, autophagy, proteasome transport mechanisms, which are the key components? So right, right now there's too many genes, 2,000 genes. But if we can identify which of those 2,000 are really the nodes mm -hmm. from a systems biology perspective of quality right. control, it may be that biology evolved a system where these nodes were talking to each other, yep. and those are the ones that we have to watch, and they may tell us when the system is in decline. So imagine that instead of waiting till somebody is 75 mm -hmm. and has dementia, that you can now see in epithelial cells even, uh, that there's a decline in quality control right. capability in the cells. And you see it getting worse the next year, very much like we do with blood tests. That might be an approach where when therapeutics are available, right. you now know how much to bring the system back up. And you could do it with epithelial cells because Obviously, um, doing it with neurons may not be easy uh -huh. uh, from real brain tissue. You can certainly do IPS or trans differentiation, so I'm hopeful for that. Right. Yeah, because I, really, I, I think it's a really interesting idea. It's really applicable actually to many disease settings Every, to really find what's the best <coughs> timing for intervention right. and whether it's we're just waiting for too late. And especially, it even comes into the play, into the idea of combo therapy. Like, right. do you start combo therapy to begin with or you just do things sequentially until at one point you just cannot turn the system around? Right, right. So I, I, really, I really appreciate and I really like that point. And uh, around the idea of the hub, like certain hub that's really important for this entire mm -hmm. system from the system biology like right. angle, I was also intrigued about, I think there are ideas flowing around that it could also be self-specific let's say a progenitor yes. cells, differentiated yes. cells, or maybe a stem cells, maybe the hub is different. Mm -hmm. So where do you see our understanding in terms of that? I think we are at the beginning. Mm -hmm. there, there's a certainty. There are 2,000 genes in what we define as the proteostasis network. Right. It's strongly dominated by the ubiquitin proteasome system, autophagy, yeah. translation, folding, transport. Um, of those 2,000 genes, Clearly, there's going to be tissue and lineage specificity. Yep. There's no question about that. Because you could well imagine that the proteome in a highly secretory cell, whether it's a B cell, a T cell, or a epithelial cell, yep. is going to be very different than a neuron yep. or a muscle cell. And so we're starting, and so you can imagine, as you co-evolve a proteome that has uh, myofilaments and mm -hmm. it has a myosin actin contractility for assembly disassembly, the proteins required to keep that proteome stable are going to be very different than, yes. let's say, an epithelial cell. Right. And so we are exactly at that beginning stage right now. So in C. elegans, we now are starting to develop an understanding. Our lab is shifting as well into human. Uh -huh. We're using a lot of the available GTEx data to now ask what does it look like in We've already published a study on the brain, we're looking at muscle, we're yep. looking at the heart, we're looking at the intestine, to actually ask your question, what does it look like in different tissues? Right. And that gives us an understanding of collapse. Yep. As it changes, what are the balances? What's the threshold? What's right. the risk factor? Yeah.
No, I think it will be very intriguing too. I think to it's going to be exciting. Yeah, at one point to have really a clear map yeah. of what's so going on. So it is a form of, of molecular medicine or yep. precision medicine. But I think in this case, what it does is it's based on a combination of biochemistry mm -hmm. and expression studies. That, that you want to take cells from an individual and actually ask, how robust is your quality control system? Right. And you combine that with expression information, and I think together that might give a very interesting index yeah. for where a person is chronologically in their cellular health. Right. And I think to bring it back to the point that you just mentioned, IPSC, it's also because I would imagine, I don't have any evidence, but I would imagine that certain hubs, they could differ in a subtle way that based on different people's genetic background or just based on different people's genetic background evolved during aging process. So to really have the whole robust system to identify in a very personalized aspect and really hopefully to treat disease like that would be really powerful. Well, I'll just share with you, I was in Japan in April, yeah. and uh, there are currently 60,000 centenarians in Japan, 90% uh -huh. of which are women. Yeah. So an interesting question is, is there a particular combination of genes and environment in Japan yep. that leads to longevity? So Japan currently has the highest percentage and the largest number of centenarians. Now, other countries are going to, of course, catch up since it's an aging society, uh -huh. but I think since we know that genes and environment have to work together right. and we're learning about epigenetics like at this meeting yep. and about the role of diet and exercise, yep. I could imagine that in different countries how those combinations come together plays a critical role and this could be a very interesting way to discover. For example, are the genes in China and environment different than Chinese Americans? So after Chinese Americans have been here for 120 years, yep from 1890. My parents, my grandparents came from Japan in 1896. Uh -huh. So, you know, our DNA is still Japanese DNA, but the environment is completely different. Yeah. So it, it, it'll be interesting to understand those interactions. Definitely. Yeah. It'll be very fascinating study. Right. Yeah. And so just sort of get more on the therapeutic side right. in the end. And I was curious, do you think we now have enough of the knowledge to begin with to really have direct either drug or medicine to really tackle those dis to tackle those um, proteostasis issue in the disease context or we're still far away from that? I think we're close. Uh -huh. um, I think it, we now understand enough molecular mechanisms. We, we have identified uh, the exact chaperones that are involved with different client proteins. Yep. So we're at a point now of being able to achieve selectivity. I see. Because if, for example, you want to change folding and you affect HSP70, well, there's a 70 in the mitochondria, the ER, yep. and in the cytoplasm. I think evidence that this is possible is the efforts of pharma with HSP90 inhibitors. Uh -huh. Every pharmaceutical company is working on that yes. because if you block HSP90, you clear these clients that are important for rapid growth of cells, right. and therefore it's an anti-cancer therapy. Yep. They did not design it as a proteostasis therapy, yes. but it becomes a proto it becomes a wonderful example. Also, it says something that we'd never expected, that you could inhibit HSP90, one of the most abundant chaperones that regulates hundreds of clients, and it does not kill the organism. Yep. So, th so that means that there's a concentration that actually works perfectly. So that gives us a lot of hope. Right. that you can reset the system. So I think this is going to be a really a remarkable era where we're going to be able to look at age-associated degeneration, mm -hmm. maybe look at the markers and where someone's at, and in a sense reset the system. Watch it as it declines, shift it back. I think the key for me is don't shift it abruptly. Mm -hmm. Retune the system so that instead of something declining, and function at the age of 60 or 70, it shifts now to 80 or 90, in which case you've done your job. Right. It's been an amazing accomplishment. Yeah, that sounds really promising. Let's well, gradually it goes to a healthier life, all of well, us. Well, I, I think quali you know, quality control is something we all understand, right? Yep. We buy cars, we buy our uh, computers, we buy almost anything technology for quality control, that you want something that's really made well. Yep. The only thing we don't control for quality control is our own bodies. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So if we could increase, you know, healthy proteostasis, I call it, I think that'll be good for us. Yeah, definitely. Sounds very great. Yeah, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Yeah.